episode 249, we interviewed a neuroscience about something that is a craze right now, and that is this neurotherapy of the brain, biohacking the brain. Well, look, in this episode, you're going to want to see this. I literally took my son, Simon, to one of their brain mapping locations, and we mapped his brain. You're going to get to see that, but what's really cool is they hook him up, his brain up to a computer, and you're going to get to see the training that basically all of you can get at home uh, once you get your brain map. And literally when I was in there, I expected to see all these ADHD kids and seizure and autistic children because it's amazing for that. But I saw CEOs and salespeople biohacking their brains with neurofeedback um, to basically perform better. Wow, wait till, you, wait till you see this episode. It's, you're, it's going to bring uh, this neurofeedback to a whole nother level uh, for most of you. But if it's ADHD, if it's OCD, if it's a brain conditions, if it's seizures, and, and if it's just performance, you're going to want to stay tuned to this episode. Hello everyone, welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith and today we are welcoming back one of the top peak performance brain coaches in the country, Dr. Andrew Hill. Dr. Hill holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA's Department of Psychology and continues to do research on attention and cognitive performance. Dr. Hill is the founder of Peak Brain Institute. He's host of the Head First podcast with Dr. Hill and lectures at UCLA teaching courses in psychology, neuroscience, and gerontology. You can revisit Dr. Hill's previous interview with Dr. Pampa on episode number 249. So I'll turn this over to you both. Welcome Dr. Pampa and Dr. Hill. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah, no, we had to have you back. Well, you know, we had so many questions about it that, you know, I was out there doing another interview and I, I said, okay, we have to do a part two, and, and I'm mm -hmm. going to bring my son, Simon, who's ADD, ADHD, some OCD qualities in there, all of which I believe are part of his gifting. Um, mm -hmm. However, you know, uh, I wanted to bring him in for a brain mapping and um, therefore film that, that we could actually share that video, which we're going to in this episode, and then also, uh, the unique treatment, uh, how that actually works and looks at. Because in the first episode, y'all should watch episode 249 uh, because we'll probably, you know, talk about some different things there than we will here. But we did, I, I feel like it was kind of hard to bring out exactly what we were talking about. And that's why I did those videos because then you could see exactly what we mean how you train the brain, because there's, there's Simon training the brain in one of the videos that we're gonna share with you today. So stay tuned, you know, great, great episode. But let, let's remind them, uh, Doc, you know, this is becoming a, a, a more popular topic, neurofeedback, and how, you know, we do this. As a matter of fact, when I was at the clinic, I mean, I, I expected, you know, room full of uh, ADD kids, and I got a couple CEOs yeah. that were just, biohacking their brain yeah. for better performance, you know, and, and another guy in sales who was biohacking his brain for better performance. So yeah. I was a little shocked about that. So let's recap. What is neurofeedback and who's it for? Obviously, it's more than I thought. Sure. So neurofeedback broadly is biofeedback on your brain. And biofeedback is this process of measuring uh, physiological processes and training them or exercising them in some way. And, you know, when we, we use the word biofeedback, we think of sort of, you know, people relaxing and using sort of meditative type things. And there is a lot of biofeedback that is very relaxing. But when we think of that style of biofeedback, um, including things like hand warming and heart rate variability and stuff like that, we're training to some extent the peripheral nervous system to a large extent. And uh, what we're talking about in neurofeedback is central or, or central nervous system biofeedback. That's what we call it, neurofeedback. And, and that includes training the EEG or brain waves, as well as the HEG or the blood flow, the hemoencephalography, the, the dynamics of blood flow. And by training, I mean we measure what the, the systems are doing on their own moment to moment. So whenever the brain happens to shift a little more in the right direction that we think it should actually 
exercise in, we go, good job brain, with an audio visual stream. And when the brain does the wrong thing or moves away from the resource shifting in, in that direction, we withhold the input. And since the brain likes input, it starts to, to trend itself, if you will, right. towards whatever produces more information. And then we move the goalposts. Yeah. So it can't ever learn. We gently shape it or, or exercise it up in a certain direction or down in a certain direction for about half an hour. And it's, it's involuntary, um, as people will see. It's also sort of effortless, which is kind of, it's kind of a fun process. Uh, usually people sit in front of a computer screen and watch some sort of uh, video game or, or uh, animation change. And after a few sessions, the brain has started to figure out, oh, whenever I change a brainwave or a, a resource in a certain direction, the world changes. So it starts to exercise itself more and more over time until the resource becomes a little more permanent. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, like I said, I mean, we focused on um, ADD. I mean, I know you do this for seizures, you do this, you know, but here we saw people who just wanted better outcomes from their own brain, better performance. Yeah. Obviously, this is for anybody, but, you know, I mean, uh, I, I guess, you know, review. I mean, what, what other types of conditions do you see great yeah. results? So the field started 52 years ago on seizure because we discovered sort of serendipitously that it raises the seizure threshold, makes the brain seizure resistant. This mm -hmm. special frequency called SMR, which is um, a very calm body and alert mind. Um, predators use it to physically relax their body. Humans use it uh, to keep us deeply asleep and for some learning things. It's called sigma uh, in by neurologists or sleep spindles. Um, so if you train up the sleep spindles, you produce a stabilization of the brain, which is kind of an interesting finding in the late 60s. And that meant that from there, we were working on seizure because that it really dramatically reduced seizure. I think the average uh, a metadata study recently showed that it was like more than 50% reduction in seizures average, and 5% of people have complete control. Um, it's a very large uh, effect size. And then from there, because the EEG world largely is bound by sleep, uh, studies and sleep literature and sleep science. Um, most of what we've been doing for like 80 years in EEG is really in that space. So for instance, in brain, in, in, in neurofeedback, we use a sleep, you know, style EEG cap to do the assessments. We record 19 channels of the head and the databases we compare you to, to see how unusual your brain is, is a population level comparison. Um, the reason we use that style cap and those number of channels in the head and the reason the databases are all constructed that way is because of sleep literature for years. So we found we could change seizure conditions really quickly. And from there, the sleep literature seems to really unfold. Anxiety and ADHD become very tractable. So the low-hanging fruit are sleep, stress, and attention seizures. Those change for almost everyone reliably and over time. Um, and then the things that we found since then in the past, you know, 30, 40, 50 years include pretty much everything else your brain does uh, to be sort of broad, which is unfortunate from a business development perspective, but great for anyone's goals. So um, we can work on, um, I mean, you saw in my office, a lot of CEOs and peak performers, and that's, I think, probably more true of peak brain than other neurofeedback places. We have about a third peak performers. Um, but I also have about a third, what I would call neuro neurological clients, who's, who's it's a brain problem. Injuries, concussions, seizures, migraines, uh, even ADHD is a brain bound yeah. problem, not a psychology problem. And then you have the psychology class of people and I'm not a psychologist, I'm a neuroscientist. So I work on the resources, not the, you know, your experience of them largely, but, um, that includes things like anxiety, sleep issues, PTSD, OCD. Um, developmental trauma, um, often very significant things. Now, when it's a psychological thing, I often work alongside someone who's, you know, other team members. Um, but it works on the regulatory things, sleep, stress, mood, attention. That can be a, a symptom. Oh, attention needs to be improved because you have ADHD. Right. Or it can be a performance goal. I want to have more vigilance and be a little more on because I'm not on as much as I might want to be. And so, that's probably the big difference uh, in how peak brain works is we frame this as fitness and like a coach asks an athlete what their goals are and then architects a program for them. The, the, the coaches aren't really trying to fit what they're doing to the um, goals, not selecting those goals. And sometimes in medicine and psychology, there's a bit of a top down. Here's what's wrong. Here's what you need. And we really want to flip that and give people access and agency. So, 
we do the brain mapping and say, here's what your resources look like. What do you want to do with them? And then uh, the neurofeedback process is the exercise on those. Yeah, resources, and, and we, which, can, we have video on both of those. So let, let's talk about the mapping because that's, that's where it starts. Yeah. Right? So you, you map the brain. And then we're able to look at, okay, here's what we're dealing with. So when you went over with us, um, uh, Simon's mapping, yeah. you saw some classic AD, sure. ADHD, but you also said things like, um, did, do you have any head trauma? Yeah. Which I answered, I don't, I don't think so. And he says, well, actually, one time I did hit my head because you were able to sense that there might have been some head trauma you know, and other things just by looking at that. Yeah. So kind of explain that. And then let's actually, we'll, we'll actually break away and look at the video after you're done explaining that. Sure. Um, getting his brain map. Sure. So the, the process of gathering data is pretty low key for brain mapping. You just sit still for about 15 minutes. So it takes a few minutes to put a cap on your head. We use a cap with gel. We squirt it full of gel. It's a little messy. Um, but then you just sit still for five minutes or so, eyes closed five minutes or so eyes open, because the brain's very, very different in eyes open versus eyes closed modes. And so we want to do a, a reference database check essentially against both states. Um, we pick up all the gross activity, the, the baselines your brain is doing, compare that to a normative database of a few thousand people and age match the comparison. So we're looking at your son relative to other people his age. And age is the biggest thing that changes the EEG. And it changes with early development, it speeds up, and then late development slows down uh, in aging. But between ages you know, 20 and 60, roughly, there's no change in the EEG across age. And so by using age as our comparison, we really get this almost rock solid comparison of one person compared to the average population at their rough age. And the brain maps, because of this, are stable year after year. Right. That's what's nice about them, because you change a little bit day to day based on your variability, but not so much compared to the population's uh, mean or average. So the brain maps are really rock solid stable. They give us this nice 10,000 foot view. The unfortunate part is they aren't necessarily diagnostically valid. I mean, the, there's, there's certain patterns that show up, for instance, high uh, theta relative to beta, high theta beta ratio. That, that pattern when it shows up is diagnostic for ADHD, 94% accurate mm -hmm. to sort people into ADHD and non-ADHD buckets. That's by far the best statistic we have in this kind of data. Um, the injury marker, for instance, is a population comparison, injury versus non-injured connectivity changes. That's a very weak statistic. Doesn't pick up injuries all the time. For instance, uh, for your son, um, it was negative. Didn't show an injury, and yet I saw little hot spots of slow brain waves, so I guess there might be an injury in spite of the statistic not finding one. So. You know, I, we, we looked through a dozen pages of his data for his brain and some of his attention testing results. And um, his attention test showed he has some executive function difficulties, mm -hmm. some probably ADHD-like performance. But the brain maps didn't look classically ADHD. Yeah. They mm -hmm. looked a lot more like uh, rumination, some perseveration, getting stuck on things. I mean, the, what you mentioned about being a little ruminative or obsessive, um, that tracks perfectly with my guesses. Mm -hmm. But it's that direction. I'm hypothesizing, is it possible that he ruminates? Is it possible he perseverates? He gets a little obsessive or songs are stuck in his head. Oh, yeah. And you were like, oh, yeah. Well, then I believe my data. If, I, if, you, if you were like, no, that isn't true for him, uh, then I wouldn't believe my data. So that little marker, a little hot spot of bait on the front midline or something a little bit further back um, is a little rumination marker. This is the switching system, the cingulates. Switch your attention. Decide what's important to pay attention to. If they get a little bit overactive, it might mean that you have songs stuck in your head or you're a bit ruminative um, or bite your nails. It also might mean you're Steve Jobs and very particular and really organized. Maybe you're kind of a jerk and you know it doesn't work for people around you, but maybe it works really, really well for you to be hyper-focused, a little bit rigid and really organized. So again, my, to, to frame this, my, my job isn't to say, here's what's wrong because it's unusual. Right. To say, here's what's unusual, Let's talk about what that might mean, how that might operate for you, and let us know, you know, let's figure out if this is a bottleneck for you, if it's a gift, if it's a quirk, if it's nothing we should pay attention to, et cetera. And, and then more importantly, say, okay, let's take this data and then let's accomplish the goal that you desire. Yes. Before, because you have my son's information there. Um, I do, yeah. I can show, I can, I can pop it up if you want. On the yeah, too. so we can do that, we'll do that. But let's, let's actually show the piece of video uh, your technician, who was great, by the way, um, kind of explains what this looks like so our viewers can have a really good 
explanation or visually see what this actually looks like getting your brain map. And then we'll talk more about what we can actually do with the data. So here, we'll watch that here in one second. Brain Institute. And here with Andre, one of the yeah, one of Dr. Andrew uh, Hill's technicians, and uh, Simon. How you feel, Simon? Oh, don't move. Okay. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, Simon, why did you want to get this done? I was struggling with focus. Yep. Yeah. Focus, ADD, everything. Yeah. Actually, I'm gonna be honest with you. He saw part one of my interview with uh, Dr. Hill, and he watched it, and he said, "Dad, I want this done." So when he knew I was coming to California, uh, we made it happen for him. And I knew this would be a, a great part two. So Andre, uh, tell us what's going on here. What, what are we doing? So we have this sex sheet, it looks like a swimmer's cap. It's full of a bunch of different electrodes, um, all in different places. What we're doing is we're measuring all the electricity that his brain produces that goes to the scalp. And essentially we bridge that signal with a uh, conductive gel that right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what you're seeing on the screen over here is his live brain waves. Yeah, that's cool. And so each trace line is representative of each location on the actual scalp. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're doing here, we're going to do two recordings. One will be with his eyes closed, one will be with his eyes open. And we're uh, when he, since when he closes his eyes, the brain tends to shift a little bit in regards to the type of brain waves he's producing, uh -huh. typically. Um, so whenever you close your eyes, typically uh, a lot of slower brain waves come in as you're a circle lobe kind of shuts down a little right. bit. Um, that comes, typically, on a normal brain, that comes in. Where we find it, uh, where we find issues it is um, when you close your eyes. Typically, with anxiety or OCD, mm -hmm. close your eyes and the signal kind of stays the same. Yeah. Uh, or there's very little slow brain waves. That's typically a, you know kind of a red flag. Mm -hmm. It's just an as to what's going on. Um, right now, when I'm recording this, though, what I'm looking for is things like this to. During the editing process, I want to edit stuff like this. There's all noise that right that it's going to get eliminated. So with this information, mm -hmm. it'll it'll take you how long to edit this and just clear out all of the noise? A day or so, typically. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. So from this information, now when we were filling out mm -hmm. the forms, uh, Simon and I, he literally was able to put down what he wanted out of this, mm -hmm. meaning that he wanted more focus. Yeah. Right? So he, his school was easier, reading was easier. Yeah. He wanted like just this anxiety and OCD thing to chill out, right? Mm -hmm. So you're able to actually dial in what we want to train the brain on. Correct. Correct. Yeah, based on what we find in the overall goals. Yeah. Uh, the overall goals kind of give us, uh, okay, this is where we want to go, and kind of a starting point. But the brain map is the overall roadmap. Okay, like, these are things we should work on. Right. Uh, as we fix this, this will come in line. Uh, typically. With uh, focus, a lot of times sleep is an issue, or right. they, they may not perceive it as an issue. But they go, oh, right. I sleep fine. I sleep five hours. Right. You know, recommended sleep is you know seven to eight. You know, right. Nine yeah. Hours. So, so you know, or or maybe they're sleeping eight hours, but they're getting thirty minutes of deep sleep, which is right. Yeah, so we totally it, we're big on sleep. So this is that's why sleep is a big deal here as well as as focus and attention. I know people that just want stronger brains in specific mm -hmm. areas do this too. And Correct. Obviously, we're talking about that, but okay. So with this information then, you'll clean up the information, the data, mm -hmm. and then uh, Dr. Hill will take it and basically design a program um, for Simon that he's able Correct. to increase those parts of the brain. Correct. But this gives us the roadmap on how to do Exactly. That. So yeah. when, once, once this data gets processed, I send that out to him, right. and then you, uh, you'll go over that with you guys, whatever you exactly. have to do, or, um, and he'll tell you this is what we found, this is what this looks like. You know, you got some bit the anxiety stuff. Oh, look, it popped up. This is where it's at, and kind of give you an idea as to where um, where his brain's at relative to uh, to people his age. Yeah. Um, okay. Because this uh, when, I, cool. when we when generate those images, it is comparing. It is average. It is statistics. Mm -hmm. um, so it's comparing his brain to other people relative to his age range. Right. I got to compare him to an elderly person. Right. Those two brains are vastly different. Um, typically, with age as well, there's more. Uh, uh, you know, even if it's not traumatic brain injury, it's right. more just wear and tear damage. Yeah, so, uh, so. Absolutely, unfortunately. <laughs> so with this data and then with the goals that Simon desire, mm -hmm. then you know, Dr. Hill produces the program. Correct. And then what we're going to show in a moment is then how, what he is able to do at home <laughs> with this uh, other device called QWIZ, right? Yes. And then that's going to be 
him training it, and then he'll create that. And exactly. in a month, considerable results. Yeah, think, typically yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're gonna, in a moment, we'll be able to show what that looks like. We're we'll actually yeah. be yeah. able to train once this uh, data Correct. is all brought together. Explain what's going on there because it's right, a cool. lot of, you just like, it looks like a lot of beeps and you're like, okay, what's going on? Yeah, awesome. So, all right, Simon, so, what do you feel? Nothing. Good. <laughs> that's what we want, nothing. Uh, so one of the things is I scared Simon. I said, okay, so we're going to be injecting this into your neck, but it won't hurt, honestly. The needle's not that big. <laughs> All right, so in, in a minute, uh, uh, you'll show that. So, okay, hang on to a second. All right, cool. All right. So. Okay, so what does that mean? You got, the, you got to see it, and like I said, your technician, you could see it was great. Um, okay, so from that, what you just saw, you know, is little with the, we, we were making fun of him because you know he had the, the little cap on there. I was sending pictures to his uh, his brothers and sisters. Um, anyway, um, but from that, by the way, the the hardest thing for him was yeah, sitting still. Um, you know, he kept having to correct them. Um, but okay, so from that, you gathered this data. You can show some of the data. I mean, uh, you know, our viewers. Um, you know, just kind of extrapolate from it the most important points, but some of the significant points, one of which you said, you know, gosh, you know, he, he sleeping deeper, I recall, yeah. was like a big, right? And eating before bed, he already made some of those changes, which I know affect him greatly. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So here's some of his brain map data on the right. These are these colored circles are uh, his brain waves, delta, theta, alpha, beta, high, beta, slow through fast brain waves. And essentially, we're looking at how unusual he is compared to the average guy his age. And so what we're seeing is in the back of his head, he's got these little orange spots, and those are about two to three standard deviations, about two, two and a half actually. And this little marker is that posterior cingulate. That wow. I, I mentioned the cingulates a minute ago. The cingulate's job, the posterior, is to evaluate the environment and make sure that what we're doing is gonna stay safe. So if you're driving a car and you don't look at the road, there's a sense of, uh, watch the road, thrown by the cingulate. Well, if, the, if you learn the world isn't always predictable, or if you learn to be a little fear-driven, the evaluator ramps its, its, itself up a little bit. You typically see this. That's why I was guessing uh, some sort of rumination, worry or chewing on things for him. Yeah, he's a uh, worrier. I, that was something that was yeah. very, very accurate. He's, he's worried about his health all the time. He's extra. Mm. So that was, yeah, so, so he's evaluating. He's constantly evaluating. That's, that's the constant. back, back midline guy. And, and, with the, and um, in this uh, little visualization here, this is actually eyes closed data. And so usually when you close your eyes, the back of the head will relax. The, the, the visual system drops in activity. So with your eyes closed, if the back is really lit up, and it's lit up in the cingulate right there, but also broadly against the back of the head in beta, that means that the visual system is staying lit up just in case. So it's this hypervigilant and then kind of ruminative combination I'm seeing for him in this one map, mm -hmm. uh, one, one page we're seeing. Uh, and then we also saw, you mentioned sleep. So here's some frequencies of his brain. And um, some of his alpha waves, which are his processing speed, his resting speed, are running a little slow, about a standard deviation in some places. And usually people's alpha runs slow when they're having trouble sort of focusing, having some afternoon short-term memory and some word finding. That can drag down the beta frequencies, the thinking frequencies here. And it can affect the, the delta, which is a deeply rested frequency. Um, for him, his delta is a little fast. It's half to almost a full standard deviation above average some places. And it's not dramatically fast, but it's right in the edge of what I was guessing. If you don't get enough deep sleep at night, dreamless sleep, then when you're awake, your brain pushes back a little bit. And it sort of micro sleeps or browns out. And often that produces fatigue and almost always poor performance and things like short-term memory and maintaining focus. Which... Well, one of the things is that you asked him, and it was right on, was you know, do you get a little fatigue, like, you know, in school? And, yep. and I, he said, oh, yeah, I can only do like an hour at a time. And after that, I'm fatigued. I, I'm, and he's done. I mean, he just yeah. puts down his teeth. Yeah, the cognitive fatigue is really a big deal. I, I was guessing about it from the Delta. And then when he opened his eyes, here's the eyes open maps. The, the slow brain waves went up when you open your eyes. That's the opposite of what should happen. And oh. this basically literally means his brain is browning out in energy. It's just kind of, you know, going a little bit asleep when he opened his eyes. The slow brain waves theta when they're excessive means the brakes are off. You know, squirrel, it's hard to focus. Oh, that's um, <laughs> so he's got a really hard, it's on the left side of his head. So his vigilance or sustained focus is a big deal too. You see coherence or connectivity here at the bottom, the red, red cluster means his delta waves are stuck together. They aren't changing moment to moment. And the delta is that sleepiness. 
So he's foggy, fatigued, irritable, anxious, impulsive. You know, it looks kind of like he's struggling a little bit. So, however, I mentioned that the most valid marker in the data is these theta beta ratios. Mm -hmm. In spite of performing very ADHD like on the test here, which I'll mention in a minute, he doesn't show the classic ADHD markers. Yeah. Which means it's more driven, you know, atypical ADHD. So it's more driven by stress and sleep or reactivity. So those markers are pretty clear the rumination, fear driven stuff, the sort of hypervigilance, and the brain fog markers are very clear. Mm -hmm. And so I can guess about those, but I don't, I wouldn't guess ADHD purely on the maps because he doesn't have high theta beta ratios here. Right. Um, now, if you look at his performance, I always do these things together because they're uh, useful this way. His attention, which is not missing things, is kind of soft. This test is scored where 100 is the middle of a bell curve and 15 points off either side is roughly typical and then beyond that isn't. Um, and for him, he's scoring very low on what's called vigilance and focus or being alert and staying on when things aren't changing for both auditory and visual. So these scores are getting in his way and these are suggesting ADHD like performance hmm. on this side. It's impulsivity. Same thing as prudence isn't he's not being very careful. He can't monitor what he's doing very well. And that does trip positive for population level checks for inattention and impulsivity. So on the behavior he looks kind of impulsive mm -hmm. and inattentive and looks like he's performing an ADHD way. Right. But then when you dig into his brain, he looks kind of burnt out and brain foggy and he's not focusing very well and he's ruminating a little bit and he's perseverating, a little stuck on things and kind of anxious. And so I'm not surprised he's uh, impulsive, but I wonder if some of it isn't being reactive, not impulsive. It's more about an anxiety, less of a disinhibition. And ADHD is often the brakes are off with high theta or they're the, you can't shift into gear with high alpha. Right. And he's got too much accelerator in the extreme and he's got too much of the really very slow brain waves, the delta. So it's the extremes for him that are more in, in frequencies that are more excessive. And that suggests something that isn't exactly ADHD from my perspective. But again, as you said earlier, my goal isn't to, to sort of get to the right label. It's to help make a change. Right. And, I'm often dropping one level below the label people are using anyway. So you came in with some, some sense, attention problems, some stress problems. And I look at his brain and go, whoa, look at these rumination and perseveration markers. Look at this poor deep sleep marker. Wow, this, this guy's probably struggling and foggy. And I was able to describe his, his experience looking at his physiology, but not necessarily talking about capital letters of OCD and ADHD. So, I mean, we didn't have any like major head traumas um, that I knew about. He mentioned, you know, skiing once, hitting his head. What about emotional traumas? Could emotional traumas have put him into this state in his brain? Because that we had a lot of. The, the, the fast frequencies. You know, we had a lot go on. DJ, yeah, um, possibly uh, as a short answer. I can never tell when things developed in a brain map. I can tell they're stable traits at this point, not a snapshot state. Like they won't change year after year at this point unless you do something significant to the brain. But the, the switchers, the anterior cingulate and posterior cingulate being a little hot in betas is a very common thing to show up when there's trauma. When, they're, when the back one's active, the people are very uh, threat sensitive, evaluative, uh, PTSD things. When the front is active, it's OCD type things, mm -hmm. or you know, being a high-powered CEO, that can be very similar. But it's those switching systems get really ramped up when the brain figures out it better darn well, you know, keep its attention on what is important and threatening. Right. So yes, the, a lot of the things that I'm seeing on the right-hand side of the document, if you will, the faster frequencies that are really blown up could be from emotional or psychological trauma, you know, wear and tear in that way. The really slow brain waves, the delta brain waves being excessive are usually um, either a quirky brain, he just happens to show up in the world with this brain, or they're an impact. Usually you have an impact, um, if the brain gets pushed on, all the connections into that area aren't informing the area anymore. It's kind of smushed, that's the technical term. And it tends to default back to the, the brainstem frequency, which is delta, like the heartbeat of the brain. If you see the little hot spot of delta, that goes up when you open your eyes, it usually means that area has low circulation and you open your eyes to metabolically open, activate it and it actually shuts down further, which we can see here. I'll show you yeah, again. That's why you thought um, you might've had a head blow. I wondered. That. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. And I can never tell for sure. And I shouldn't tell for sure. This is medicine, right. but I can go, you know, is this brain fog? And that sounds valid. So here's this Delta. 
Um, let's look at it actually in different visualizations. Barely there in this visualization, linked ears. And then when he opens his eyes, here's the same delta. Mm. So it goes up by three standard deviations over the left ear and the back of the head, it goes up by two. And there's almost this sort of like line of force showing up in some of the maps, mm -hmm. left to right, front to back, you know? And so I wondered about a line of force at some point hitting his head either back there or hitting the front and causing a coup contra coup, the brain rocking a little bit. But it doesn't make sense to me that Delta wouldn't show up with eyes closed where Delta is actually higher in amplitude. So it's, it's there a little bit, but not dramatic. And then when he opens his eyes, it blows way, way up. That was a little concerning to me in terms of, okay, this is unusual. And so I know that the coherence, the connectivity being stuck and the high delta amplitude, I know those two things likely mean that he is brain fog. So that's a, that, that's a phenomena. He's experiencing the phenomena of brain fog, lack of stamina, short term, you know, hits the afternoon, oh, leave me alone, no more decision making, no more homework. Oh but it's, it's, it's a resource, he's running out of gas. It's yeah. not a, a willful thing. Yeah. So I, I see the brain fog, guess the brain fog, that makes sense. And my response is to get excited because now we have things to go after for him. Right. I don't know why it's there. I don't know if he had a head injury from skiing at, you know, five years ago. I don't know if he happened to show up in the world with a quirky brain that has a tendency to sleep poorly and get anxious. I don't know if an old injury caused a disruption in his sleep and he's ramped his stress response up in compensation for that. Or if old trauma produced stress response, things were a bit dysregulated and then threw off his sleep. It's all chicken and egg from my perspective. At right, this right. Yeah, well, what, one of the things that you'd mentioned is, um, you know, monitoring his sleep. And I, I gave him my aura ring a few times, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, he definitely wasn't very good deep sleep, which you kind of predicted right. that. So yeah. you gave him some suggestions to not eat before bed, which, um, you know, I, I keep reminding him not to do that. But he is developing new habits, so okay. we're, we're working on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, just from looking at that data, you, you made some recommendations. But then the second part was right there on the spot, and we'll show the video, is now you're able to take that and you're able to develop a protocol for him. So your technician then said, okay, well, you know, he was obviously asking the question that many people watch the first episode ask. Well, what, what does that mean we can train the brain, right? What does yeah. that look like? So he sat him down at the computer, hooked his brain up differently to a new device, and there he sat in front of the computer, and um, he was able to basically look at the computer screen and, you know, basically uh, adjust things based on his brain, his own thinking. So uh, l let's just show the video. So people I can under, watch him do this. And then I'm going to have you explain it, okay? But let him get the visual first because it's very confusing otherwise. So hang on here and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at what that looks like. So here we are in the training portion, which can be done obviously here or at home, actually, right. which is really cool. And that's the, that little device. Where is it? Oh, it's yeah, back yeah, here. It's, it's, really, it's right here, this little device here. That he's, yeah. His brain's connected to it. Okay, so this is cool. Yeah, I'm telling you, this is really cool. His brain is actually running this video game. Right. So if you explain it from there. So with the, with that little device you mentioned, we actually have electrode, one electrode on his head and one on each oh. ear, and we're recording signals into his brainwave from that location. On the computer here, this is his raw brainwave. All his, I mean, there's some noise right there that was on the movement, but we're recording his raw brainwave, and then we're filtering out three different three different bands from that brain, from essentially this raw data. And every two minutes and 50 seconds, he's in the hospital, he's on the moment. Um, slow brain waves, medium brain waves, fast brain waves. Typically, okay. muscle tension, noise, things like that. Uh -huh. Going to clench your uh, jaw for me, Sammy. Clench your jaw. Yes. There you go. Oh, that, yeah. That's Look all the that. noise. And you can, uh -huh. you can let go of that. Uh -huh. So, essentially, you can let go of that. Now it's going back in the room. So, give it a second to All right. So, um, these bands that we were. Uh, separated essentially from the raw data are represented over here. Okay, yeah, so, so these are like fast brain waves? Yeah. You think mm -hmm. one little adjustment here yep. like this? Okay, I don't need to see. Uh, yes, so this is the brain wave we're rewarding, and these are the two are in cavity. So we're asking his brain uh, to produce more of a particular brain wave. In this case, it's that medium fast brain wave, uh -huh. what we call beta S1. Okay, and then the other, the other two brain waves are Essentially, this pink one is associated, it's essentially in the range between theta and alpha. It's just the end of, the end of theta and the 
Dino Alpha. And then potentially what we call high beta is really much so if he's crunching up, anything like that, or if you're clipping that data out, because we don't, we could technically train someone to actually pretend to get some information. Okay. So we're clip, clipping that so out. So ba basically, his brain, this is what we want. Exactly. So yeah. actually, we, we want a few things. One, you want this green bar to be expanded like it is. Uh huh. Uh, you want these two bars on the side to be uh, to go down minimized. So okay. just because this green bar is expanded, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll get more for squeaking breath and breathing. If you use A, produce more of this particular brain wave, mm -hmm. and B, produce uh, less of these other two. So you can explain why we're doing this. In other words, why do we want this more of this particular brain wave with less of these? And, you know, so with, with the Montet order we have uh, right now, it's geared more towards focus. Okay, so as uh, so this is like an ADD thing, so more towards focus, yeah, and less towards uh, the sensation. Typically, the smaller brain waves tend to be associated more with either tiredness, distractibility, you know, and spacing out, daydreaming, things like that. So, you want to limit that, you want to limit any A, if he's having any anxiety, or B, any muscle injury, it's just constantly tense. You want to okay. limit that, and then by doing that, along with the actual brain rewarding, potentially, might be. Long enough, uh, get more focus. Um, and the longer his brain's in that state, so whether his brain produces more of the particular brain wave or less of the other two, his performance meter will be up like that. Okay. And so as that performance meter fills up, it's just going to let the car which will perform better. A will okay. pass, A will go. And that's rewarding the brain. Exactly. Because his brain knows it's going better. Okay, exactly. So A, the car will go faster. Uh, B, you'll feel those beeps. Uh, and those are all rewards. The reward because, because he's sorry. staying in that focus, in that ring area. Exactly. And so, as the brain is in that range for a longer period of time, you're going to get more consistent beeps. So, and every ten, about two minutes, fifty seconds, it's a rest. Break. Exactly, uh, it's a rest. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, once it resumes, um, one thing to note too, and I you know I mentioned this to you earlier, is it may never feel like it's getting any easier. Yeah. And that's because we have essentially kind of a sliding window where we're adjusting the difficulty. We want to kind of push your brain as much as we can, but not too hard, essentially. So it's getting too difficult, we make it a little easier. Yeah, because too you easy. said that people could literally leave exhausted if you could if you push push it hard. Exactly, yeah. And that, that means we went a little too hard. That's kind right. of going to, go to the gym for the first time. And like, right. I might do everything. Too, and too much, yeah. Exactly. The next day, you're, you're painful. So, um, but yeah, so essentially, all he needs to do is sit back and watch. His brain does all the work. Um, it's amazing. So, you know, as long as he's not on YouTube or something else that's more engaging, um, even the training still works, but it's not as effective as him. And, and you said out. literally, instead of doing this, you could also do be connected while he's reading because reading, it, as long as it's something he doesn't actually like, exactly, it works. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, it works regardless, but it's more, yeah. it's more effective, more yeah. effective. Yeah. It's, it could, it's so something. homework for doing this with homework. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we learned we need to use a few different things. We just use simply auditory, uh, auditory stimulus. So it just repeats stimulus. Whatever his brain is raised, he's getting engaged. It rewards it. Exactly. And he's in that focus. It rewards it. Exactly. And his brain knows it's being rewarded. Over time, it begins yeah. to learn. Because right now, it's like certain weird patterns going on here. Like, getting beeps and the His brain begins to figure out what it needs to do. So yeah. It's the reward. So, so, I mean, so the bottom line is, it's working on the basic way we train a dog. Human to a certain extent, yes. I mean, meaning that we're rewarding the brain for rewarding it for certain wavelengths that will create focus, calm, exactly. right? Yes. And, and then, so it was interesting because there was a gentleman just here. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have ADD, ADHD, OCD, um, or sleep problem. Well, he did say it improved his sleep mm -hmm. a lot, but he was doing it for work. He was doing it for performance, Correct. literal, just to be like, like be better at work. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we get all sorts of people in here, um, range from just kids with you know struggles with ADD, focus, you know, CEO type, just want performance or yeah. something like that. Also, traumatic brain injury. Uh, it's a big one that we yes. have yeah. every client I've at least worked with personally has had great benefit from from the training in regards to the symptoms from the traumatic brain injury. Yeah, you've been here six years. Doing I've, been with, I've been working with yeah. Dr. for about six years. Yeah, so yeah. it's awesome. been a long time. So, yeah. but yeah, so um. All sorts of ailments, um, you know, just even if it's just sleep issues, but typically when you have sleep issues, it's always tied to something else, whether it's um, to keep it inside. So yeah, usually yeah. hand in hand. Um, but, um, but yeah, so all he needs to do is uh, sit back and watch. So his brain does all the work. Yeah, so I mean, his brain is being trained, rewarded, yes. 
to get in, and then eventually his brain knows how to stay in. Exactly. Uh, and as I, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, with the difficulty, in order to keep pushing the brain, we'll make it a little bit harder. Yeah. Like harder and harder. And then if it gets, we get a little too far, then we can, we can dial it back. All right. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna, how do I know what I'm training? Like, like what am I, what, what's my brain working on? So like I mentioned before, we're working he asked, on, what is his brain training on? What's his brain working on? Calm focus, essentially. We want you to be able to focus, but not to the point where you're anxious. You know, because there is there is a bit where you can trigger yeah, someone to so actually be more anxious. Right. Yeah, because the, one of the things you said too is his feedback's important. Correct. Because if he's anxious doing this, we, you literally can train his brain to being anxious. Exactly. And yes. so, it, it, you can communicating saying, "No, I'm feeling better." Or if he says, or I, "I'm not feeling anything right now." Or if he says, "I'm not," if he doesn't communicate that he's not sleeping as well, that could be an issue. Because yes, we could correct. actually be correct. training the brain. Yes. Yeah, so the brain map. So it's important that you communicate with us how you're feeling. And the brain map we did earlier, like I mentioned, it's it's a it's a good roadmap map, and it's uh, it's statistic based, but it's um it gives us our starting point and what we want our goals and what we want to work on, and also based on what he wants to work on, but. Just because we're, unfortunately and fortunately, like I mentioned earlier, brains, everyone's brains do. Yeah. Um, just because we train it a specific way based on what his brain shows may not necessarily be the best one to actually do. Yeah. So it's it's a combination of the, the map that we get yes. and his feedback. Right. And eventually we train his brain. Yes, yes exactly. So cool, <laughs> isn't it? All right, let's go back and hear from uh, Dr. Andrew. So awesome stuff. But yeah, 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 appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. Thanks for no problem. All right, we got it here. Okay, so there's there's him doing. Uh, you can see him with, with you know basically thinking, and the technician saying you know basically you know just watch the screen. Your brain will do the rest. Right. Explain that to people. What yeah. the heck is going it's on? it's really the, the the hardest part of neurofeedback from the, the client point of view is often what do you mean it's involuntary? Like they don't understand how they could be exercising their brain without trying, and they don't understand how a um, bunch of animations could be changing their brain. But the, what was often sort of missed in the explanation is that there's a loop created between the brain and the computer. Just like you picked up a, a tool and hit, and hit some buttons, like you, you have to learn to use the tool. Or even before you pick up a tool, when you're a baby and you're flopping around and, you, and the random firings happen to move your left arm up and you go, whoa, hey, that was cool. Right. That's probably the crawling thing I want to do. Let me, let, me, let me do more of that. The brain's always watching the variable signals and the input, the output, and always trying to take control of them. So your son was sitting there watching a, a, a game, a, an animation, and we had two ear clips on his ears and one wire in his head. So it's not very involved in terms of the training days. It's pretty you know, quick to set it up. And we just simply measured what his brain was doing moment to moment. And we measured his uh, calm focus beta, sort of a low beta, and we also measured his distractible theta brain waves, impulsivity and things. And whenever the impulsivity brain waves dipped down a little bit for half a second on their own, and the beta climbed for half a second on its own, the software would go, good job, brain, by making the trolley car run faster and steer better and go ding, 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 ding. So stimuli will always increase in these games and the brain happens to do a little more of the right thing and will decrease and the brain does more of the wrong thing. The only trick that's not obvious uh, sometimes is that every few seconds I move the goalposts. So we sort of say, brain, do that. Yeah, good job, brain, now do that. And just gradually shape it up or down, and so the person's experience is having the game stop and start, that's it. And there's really not much of a voluntary experience to the process. You can get in the way of it by moving too much and tightening your jaw and things, but you can't really make it work any better. I mean, it, it, it's really an involuntary process. This is, uh, of course, illustrated by the fact that many teenagers don't wanna be in my office and they still have great results after they start getting their brain changed. Um, but also it works on non-verbal people. It was discovered 52 years ago on cats. Uh, yeah. I usually tell the joke now that, you know, cats are very bad instruction followers. This is not a voluntary process. Uh, Dr. Sturman trained cats by squirting chicken broth into their mouth whenever um, a certain brainwave increased. So over mo you know, months later, these cats had brains that had a change, uh, you know, a, a seizure resistant brain from the, from the signal increase. So, it's a gentle process of exercise. You don't feel too much. I'm guessing your son didn't notice much at all right afterwards. Maybe a touch of fatigue if he's very sensitive or a touch of maybe better sleep that night if he's very sensitive. But usually it's about a few sessions in, you know, three, four, five, half hour sessions of training. And then your brain starts to go, hey, wait a minute. 
oh, when I drop my theta and raise my, my column beta or my alpha, stuff happens in the world and it starts to build that resource. And then you get about a day effect after every training session. And so the voluntary part of the process from Simon's perspective isn't what he's doing in the chair. It's to say up front, here's what I want to work on. And then the next day, oh, here's what I noticed. My sleep changed this way, my alertness, my stamina. I'm noticing this stuff. And if he's a teen and can't report it, we rely on the parents sometimes a little bit more to report what's changing. And three, four weeks in with ADHD, we hear things like, I asked him to take the trash out. He did it with one request. Yeah. That was weird. Or things like that. The executive function starts to shift or sleep shifts. And you start to see things show up. Based on what shows up, we iterate. It's kind of like a personal trainer that has to build a plan for you because your muscles are so unique that no one's had them before. So you have yeah. to kind of build up a workout and try things. And in, in, that, in that plan, you, I mean, you build the protocol based on what you see obviously in the brain mapping what the person wants. So yeah. the guy that was there doing, he was doing the same thing. He was there in front of the same game Simon was. Maybe that was a little different game. There was like men running around. But, yeah. you know, he sat there the whole time doing it, doing it. And I asked him questions afterwards, you know. He's, you know, he's like, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I noticed a major difference, you know. And, and, again, he was doing it basically to basically perform better at work. I mean, yeah. that's why he was doing yeah. this particular gentleman. And I said, well, how's it working? He said, it's working amazingly well, actually. And so, and I said, well, how did you notice the game? You know, is the game getting easier? He said, oh yeah, it is. You know, okay. so, and he, you know, I mean, he, obviously I was asking him some hard questions and I'm like, really? Well, what, you know, I, I was pushing him, but uh, I didn't want to film him. I should have, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I was telling that obviously it works and it works step by step. And matter of fact, you're sending, uh, you're sending us, um, the cool thing about it is we had our brain mapped and we can, you have different places around the country to do that, but you're sending us actually the stuff to hook them up uh, yeah. so we can do it at home. Yeah, about a third of my clients are more trained themselves at home. So once I have your brain in the can and I can talk to you about your yeah. goals and get some starting places, then I can really teach you to stick wires to your head and run software pretty easily. The hard part is, is learning what to do next. All right. So um, my home trainers will do an intensive one of the offices and then a three month period of supervision where they get you know, support fine tuning and adjusting and building out, building this workout plan for them. And then they're given uh, uh, complimentary brain maps in the future without charge as long as they want. And they're given, uh, I mean, the equipment that they get trained up on doesn't ever expire. So it's really, uh, a lot of my home trainers want to do it because they have long-term goals, these biohacker types, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they have um, a problem to work on that doesn't get fixed rapidly. You know, some things take longer, concussions and brain injuries, autism, you have to train for at least six months instead, you know, ADHD, anxiety, and sleep issues, usually three months is, is good to get a really big chunk. Mm -hmm. I, I usually do 40 sessions in three months of training, uh, Dr. Pampa, and I often get about two standard deviations or close to it in, the, in that amount of time in terms of objective change on the brain maps and subjective change, or if you will, performance change on the attention tests. Um, they, they, they converge, they change together, and they change with the person's experience, which is obviously the most important thing. But we can almost mathematically say, oh, okay, 25 sessions or so, that's about a standard deviation change in uh, performance. And so, for instance, if you look at um, Simon's attention test, you see that his performance metrics here, his overall attention is a 55, roughly, and that's three standard deviations off of where he wants to be. So I would guess that he will need something like, you know, 40, 50, 60 sessions to really get um, uh, these up. It may, may not take as many because it's a couple of specific bottlenecks for him. It's vigilance and focus that are really low, but speed's great. Mm. So he's, a, he's, he's using his quickness because he can't stay alert enough, essentially. But if the focus and vigilance come up, we might see them change a lot faster. We might not. But, you know, I can kind of look at this and go, oh, okay, that's the sort of degree of uh, magnitude of bottleneck he has. And if he identifies or, you know, you identify this is a necessary thing to work on, we then target these specific resources and it's not really about getting the effects. It works for pretty much everyone. It's about dialing in the exact effects you're looking for. Yep. You know? And I, you know, I asked the question, well, can you do it um, without the game? And he said, actually, you can almost do it even when you sleep, but it works better. Um, did you say it works better if it's a game they don't love too much? Because I can it, say it. <laughs> it can actually, yeah. It works better if it's, if it's immersive and a lot of stimuli is coming back. And so a lot of the video games we use will have several streams of information coming back. But I did my dissertation work on a simple audio uh, beep with a picture filling in a picture square 
um, and kind of doing a puzzle piece thing. It's very simple. And I do a lot of training with my clients with audio only. So sleeping, you, you, you can train when people are sleeping. It does work, but you're right, not, not quite as well. So I generally don't train people who are sleeping unless they have problems staying awake and have developmental issues and falling asleep all the time. That happens uh, sometimes. Okay. But non, non, uh, uh, just auditory only training works great. So you can sit and work on things, your licensing exam, your taxes, your great American novel, and just work on it. And whenever the, your brain's in the zone, the audio swells in volume and continues and then what drops away. So your away brain picks up these rewards no matter what. And when you, you know, theta goes up or whatever you're trying to accomplish based on the mapping, you reward the brain. That's why it's a very specific protocol that you develop, right? You're rewarding the brain where you want. And that could be many different activities. But okay, we, we saw, we got the brain to do what we want in that particular focus. And then it's rewarded. And eventually, without you knowing it, your brain is picking up on the rewards. And go back to that because this was discovered. There is a story with the cats, right? Yeah. And I, I, I sure. remember, I, was it you or their technician that told me that story? So retell that because sure. it's telling how this works. So in uh, 1967, NASA went to a scientist at UCLA who was a learning scientist and said, um, hey, could you please figure out how dangerous uh, rocket fuel is because our astronauts are getting sick, breathing in vapors, they're hallucinating, getting nauseated. And so Dr. Barry Sturman, uh, at the time, his um, test subject was cats. He did a lot of work with cats. He had you know big rooms full of cats everywhere at UCLA. And he, he took about the, the 32 cats or so that were in his current subject pool, and he did an experiment on them. He, he built plexiglass cages that were airtight. He put a beaker of rocket fuel in the cage, put a cat in the cage, and started a, a timer. And rocket fuel, methyl hydrazine, is very destabilizing to the brain. Nope. Sorry. There you are. Within, within moments, uh, the cats would show um, irritation, if you will, from the methyl hydrazine, some um, crying, some, and then after a few minutes, some drooling, stumbling, and then seizures, then coma, and then death. A perfect dose-dependent curve for most of the cats. Of the 32 cats or so he had, uh, 24, I think, um, had perfect you know, dose-dependent curves. And around 40 minutes in, we're showing instability events, pre-seizure events. At 60 minutes, we're having major, major you know, brain life-threatening seizures and things. But a handful of the cats, about eight of them, did not have seizures and needed 160 minutes of exposure before they showed these instability events in the brain. And he couldn't figure out why one group of cats was like this and one group was like that in terms of time exposure until he remembered he'd done another experiment on the other group six months before to train up a certain brain wave. So whenever they made more SMR, this relaxing brain wave that I mentioned earlier, he squirted chicken broth into their mouths just to see if he could entrain it using operant conditioning, because he's a learning scientist, and he could. Wonderful, looks like this is a proof of concept. Put the cats back in the, in the subject pool, and months later, they were seizure resistant. So his lab manager epileptic and uncontrolled on meds, so they built her machine and trained her, and over the next couple of years, she went off all of her meds and remained seizure free. So this was like 1967, eight, nine, 1970, and that was the start of the field and from there, we discovered the same frequency that stabilizes the brain also eliminates ADHD, this SMR, sensory motor rhythm. So there's a strip of tissue that runs ear to ear. And just in front of a central divide is the um, uh, descending control, the motor control. And just posterior to the divide is the ascending control to do sensory information. And if you train a sort of relaxing rhythm, kind of like an alpha rhythm, but not really, on that strip, it's the equivalent of like, if you produce the rhythm, rather, it's, it's, it's relaxation, it's calming, it's an inhibition of the body. So if you've seen a cat lying on a windowsill with a liquid body and laser-like focus, what you're looking at is the opposite of ADHD, a high SMR state. Right. Because the body's physically inhibited and the mind is not. The mind's ready to go. It's poised. And in ADHD, the body's often physically disinhibited, and so is the attention system and mind. So SMR literally is the opposite of ADHD. So SMR training in neurofeedback works even better on ADHD than it does on seizure. It's, an, it's a it's dramatic, um, it's among the most reliable things we do. It works for almost everyone. Hmm. And it's a, it works on improving executive function, that inhibitory tone of not reacting too much, right. of not having, uh, you know, controlling your working memory, what you're thinking about, what you're focusing on, what you're you right. Know, right. Uh, doing. 
it, it gives you that inhibitory tone. And most of our executive function is about saying no to the other modules. You know, the CEO has to say no to the mailroom so they don't, you know, decide what to process for the CEO. Yeah. So um, inhibitory tone gives the ability to sort of like stay on task. Be a, uh, that's why you know, that's why people biohack their brains and they become better at work right or ceos or salespeople, whatever it is so right. what about an ada or, i'm sorry we know it works for that um but what about like an autistic child you know where it's yeah. are, do you have good results with that i do um i was actually trained initially working with autism in a place in providence Rhode Island, a lovely uh, neurofeedback center called the neurodevelopment center it's, a, it's probably one of the best in the world for autism um Autism is a, it's a very specific population and, and it's a very heterogeneous population. There's many, many things we call autism. So a couple of things to say about neurofeedback and autism. One, we don't usually treat or train the autism. Right. We usually train the sensory integration, the perseveration, the sleep issues, the eye contact, the language production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are all tractable. Now, the autistic brain is often quite a bit different than a typical brain. And so it takes a little longer to make change. Um, but almost every person I've worked with on the spectrum has a sort of like an irritability to the nervous system of a hard time settling and inhibiting. And again, an SMR works magic for most people to let them settle, voluntary settling. And so you get somebody who's got sensory integration issues and high pitch whining and is rocking. You know, that's really a, a flooding of the sensory system and they can't inhibit. You do a little bit of training and they're able to settle and sit and make eye contact, a little more training. You might get lucky and get some language if they're profound. Um, so I've seen some of the most amazing results in high-functioning autistic people and Asperger's where I have I had one guy come into the Providence Center every few months, every six months or so, he'd come in and say, this is a high-functioning uh, autistic guy whose obsessive interest was in jokes. He would memorize thousands of jokes. Huh. And his entire life, was walking around Providence up to people in bus stops and telling jokes. It was his favorite thing in the whole world to do was find some stranger and see if he could make them laugh. So he, he actually liked the social contact, but wasn't necessarily all that good at it. So he would train up using infrared blood flow training, HEG training, which makes your frontal very, very crisp and get your sense of humor, actually, many people to be very on and helps with eye contact and social cueing. So we were doing a lot of this with him and he, his humor got really, really on and he would come back every few months every six months or so and say uh, people are not laughing at my jokes anymore i need some more ATPs." he would use it as oh i'm not funny huh so not everything lasts in autistic spectrum people always but it's also one of the few things you can do to make a change that is like wow in a week things are changing in two weeks things are changing and often people in the spectrum have comorbidities they have seizures or you know, other developmental issues and it works on those too. Yeah. So, I mean, I often find that we work globally on a brain and lots of things change and I don't necessarily know how or why they change. Yeah. Like a personal trainer gets your whole body to change. They don't necessarily know they're working the whole body out sometimes and Oh, that, that, that pain you had. Oh, that resolve. That's great. Sometimes I'm doing that. Oh, great. I'm so happy that thing that you care about changed. And right. I don't know how it changed. <clears throat> Usually I can target the big things, the regulatory features of sleep, stress, mood, and attention. But autism, you know, we can find the, the face recognition area and the, you know, obsessions and some sensory issues and go after them. But in terms of the autism, there's another great uh, scientist doing some work in this, Rob Coben, who's a practitioner um, as well, a neuro, uh, neurofeedbacker. And Rob has found a way to train some of the connectivity issues in autism and have profound effects rapidly. And I use some of his techniques in our centers as well. Um, so the field is always at this cutting edge, unfortunately, of science, where we've outstripped the research literature by decades now, and the clinical, you know, so even the research understanding, the, the science understanding sometimes, um, you know, not caught up to the effects we can get. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a neuroscientist primarily. My, my, my training is a cognitive neuroscience. I'm an EEG scientist. And I have a really pretty good, you know, neuroscience and neurophysiology background. Um, I feel that brings this, the, the level of neurofeedback we do at Peak Brain up a lot because the neuro, it's all bound in the science. Mm. But we're also, to some extent, doing something that's very different than everyone else in the field who's also typically a therapist. Right. So we're doubling down on the science side of it and almost making this about access to the technology for the client and not about a um, a relationship of treatment, which we, we try to work away from, which is why it works so well for home trainers. 
who can learn and take agency and get you know the benefits. You know, well, let's talk about that. I mean, where can they go to get mapped? Well, I don't know, if, uh, Ashley, if we have an, a link here to put in. Um, you know. No, and then uh, you know, let's talk about that because right now people are like, okay, I, I want to get this. Yeah. Done. You know, what can we do? For yeah. We do sure. Here. So, so you can go to a few locations currently that are permanent locations. Uh, we have big offices in Los Angeles and in uh, uh, St. Louis. Those are our two big flagships. We also have some satellite offices, one in Orange County, which is Costa Mesa. We have one in Malmo, Sweden. So if you're in Copenhagen or, or Southern Sweden, you can head over and get a map done in, in Malmo. Um, and then we're opening up uh, mapping stations in uh, London, uh, probably a full office in London later this summer. Um, I also tend to do workshops these big biohacking conferences and typically bring assessment gear with me. So if folks want to uh, see us at one of these big um, conferences like the, the Health Optimization Summit in London in the fall, I'll be at doing a big workshop on brain mapping. But, you know, people can just come into one of our big offices just for a day or two and get an assessment done and everything else can be done fully remotely. So come see us in St. Louis. It's a lovely city. Yeah. It's low key. It's a cheap airport. It's, you know, 10 minutes away from the airport, no traffic, you know, great barbecue, lovely yeah. people. Well, um, we'll put, uh, Ashley will put up some type of link to make it easier for you all. And, uh, you know, we, we would, uh, you know, we'll do something special for our viewers to, to get them there. That's for sure. But, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, I have my seminar coming up here in November and, uh, it's, right there in Newport Beach. Uh, mm. Maybe we can be there doing mapping. We um, should do that. Yeah, Andre's right there in Costa Mesa, right there. So we can send him over for the day or two and uh, yeah. just churn through maps to acquire data. It'd be wonderful. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Ashley on that here. So, you know, That's because great. actually Saturday, we're even opening up our seminar to the public, right? So, you know, we can uh, be doing some mapping. But yeah, I mean, this is fascinating. I mean, this goes right, you know, with what people need today. I mean, you know, we, we don't have time in this show to talk about the things that are destabilizing the, <laughs> or the very thing we're talking about, uh, from over-medication to, you know, just to over-stimulation. I mean, what kids are exposed to today, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but there's a greater need for this. I mean, honestly. Uh, you know, and I, I think that's why the average people are reaching out to this and biohacking the brain just for better performance. Because, you know, even the overstimulation of electromagnetic frequencies and toxins, all of this plays in, you know, to why I think we need this today. So, and 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 food, you'll you'll appreciate this. I'm coming up on hour or seventy two right now of a fast. Yeah, man, uh, that's so, good for you. That's right. Uh, I haven't eaten today yet. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm approaching hour twenty four. It's all. <laughs> oh wow, it's great. It's great. Yeah, I've been in three months of alternate day fasting with a, a longer fast once a week. Just yeah. to sort of do a lot of autophagy and rehacking. So I, I I I knew you would appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. You have my my book's got coming out. You have to get it beyond fasting. I you can't wait. Fasting. Can't wait how to maximize the results and doing a lot of those little tricks like that. So, awesome. uh, well, Andrew, I, you know, thank, thank you for being on it and doing a second show and what you're doing, of course. With Simon, um, you know, because uh, this is needed. Uh, people, like I said, I, I think it's more greater today uh, than ever. So, um, but anyways, we'll put some uh, links down below for everyone watching and um, you know, absolutely get your brain mapped and it, you're making it easier for people. That's for sure to get this technology. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. And thanks so much for having me back. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. This episode was brought to you by Cyto Detox. Please check it out at buycytonow.com. We'll be back next week and every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We truly appreciate your support. You can always find us at CellularHealing.tv and please remember to spread the love by liking, subscribing, giving an iTunes review and sharing the show with anyone you think may benefit from the information heard here. And as always, thanks for listening.